Mexico. And for students who are here, non-presenters, you can leave your camera off if you don't wish to be um, recorded. So, okay, thanks, Abby. You could push record. Welcome everyone to the PGSA conference. We're here in the month of polarization and um, we have three months of presentation for our, for, our, for our conference this year. It's all online, of course, and we're recording the sessions which will be available to members on our website. Um, it's been an interesting month. It's been an interesting three months, <laughs> but it's been an interesting <laughs> month to think about polarization. The time is certainly ripe to take up this topic. And um, I'm really excited today to have three graduate students from Saybrook University, and I'll pass it over to Joy Meeker to introduce them and the panel. Thank you, Amanda. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation, presentations and conversation and dialogue that we'll have from it. Each of the presenters are PhD students at Saybrook University in the Transformative Social Change Department, which is where I also teach. And um, I'm gonna just say a few things about each of them and then we'll begin. So Shayla is gonna go first, Shayla Betts. She's a licensed clinical social worker and assistant professor of social work at a public university in central Virginia. She's focusing or does focus on white racial experience as a means to achieve racial justice and equity. Welcome Shayla. And next PC will go. PC is a student affairs professional and campus chaplain at a private Christian university in the suburbs of Sacramento. He's been working on working with college students and people in crisis for over 20 years. And he is focused on examining reasons for resistance to social justice, intersectional pedagogy, and other uh, conversations of inequity within Christian higher education. And Nancy, last but not least, is a former elected official and policymaker, and she's dedicated to professionalizing public servants and elevating civic engagement. Nancy is focused on designing better organizational systems that work for everyone. She spent over 20 years in nonprofit and public sectors, engaging stakeholders, designing programs, and developing leaders. So again, I'm really excited for um, what we have in store for us, and I'm going to turn it over to Shayla to begin. Shayla. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm going to actually share my presentation. Um, so hopefully all of you can see it and follow along with me. Okay. May I get a thumbs up that you all can see this? That is looking okay. Okay. Let me get into our presentation. Okay. Thank you. Um, so of course, our topic is inequities exposed, addressing systemic injustice in our local communities. And for my part of the presentation, I really want to focus and break down our title into three specific sections. One, of course, talking about the exposure of inequities, um, also looking at so systemic injustice, and then um, finishing up with what I am doing um, in my personal and professional life to address the systemic injustice um, in my community. And so I wanted to begin um, with a little bit of background information about me. Um, many people know that I am uh, originally from Ohio. That is my birthplace, that is my home, uh, Columbus. I'm a very proud Buckeye. Um, but growing up in Ohio, this Confederate flag was um, wildly symbolic in my life. And the messaging that I received around the Confederate flag is to um, really not even to approach with caution, but just to avoid it, um, as it is not a safe place for people of color, especially for a Black person. Uh, so growing up, we were I was taught for the first 12 years of my life with the different messaging that I received in my area and in my life, um, that this is not a symbol of welcome uh, for people who identify like I do. Um, but instead, you have to um, in some ways avoid or disengage or um, just try to caution if you are um, engage in an individual or business that has this flag um, showing widely. And then right around the time that I moved, that I turned 12, I moved to Virginia. And the messaging that I received around uh, the symbolism of this flag was not that it was necessarily a threat to my safety, but it was more symbolic of um, a person's um, heritage um, and uh, what that meant for them. And it was the term of Southern pride, but it was not meant to, um, be a threat to anyone's safety or livelihood. And so I start by saying that and giving that some background to say that many of the inequities that we will address in today's presentation, um, while we have the title inequities exposed, many of these uh, um, inequities 
are present and have been ever present. Um, so it can be argued that these inequities are rarely hidden, but at times they may be disguised as something else, as you see the two different meanings of this flag based on the two different regions where I grew up. Um, and so I will argue that while these inequities are always exposed, um, individuals may not be as aware of inequities um, in their areas. And so um, we also wanna note that that individual awareness is not necessarily justification for what is and is not present. And so this year, most notably, we've seen several inequities being addressed and they just have really become harder to ignore. Uh, and there are two main things that really brought these inequities to our focus in, in this year of 2020. And I wanna highlight two of them just briefly. Um, the first one is, of course, the impact of COVID-19. Um, that highlighted several inequities um, as it relates to race, as it relates to employment inequities, economic inequities, and things like that. And then we also see um, a huge phase of this social unrest as a response to George Floyd's murder. And so I'm going to talk about both of those um, in just a brief moment. So first I want to note about COVID. And we know in a lot of the discussions that we've had this year talking about the different inequities um, and how COVID has been affecting different populations in different areas um, despairingly. And so just out of curiosity, I wanted to pull the COVID numbers for my region and my area of my current state where I reside. And so I pulled these um, a week ago on uh, November 10th. And so Taylor, I, we're just yeah. seeing the, the first of your slides. Okay. Thank you. Let's see, let me try to stop share and then I will restart the share. You still see the first one or the second one? Um, this, we're on the first one right now. Okay. Not sure why that is. Maybe if you double click on the second slide and see if that oh, works. I there see. you go. Oh, now you can see the difference? Okay. Yes, perfect. Thank okay. you. So this was the image when I was talking before. Is this the image you saw originally? You're good now. Now we can okay. see. Perfect. All right. So I thank you. So I pulled the numbers um, for Virginia using Virginia as a baseline. And then I pulled the areas where I live and work. I predominantly live in the Richmond, Virginia, and I predominantly work in Prince Edward County. Um, and so we see the total population of each of these regions. And then we see the percentage of cases based on population. So as of last week, 2.28% of our total population has experienced um, cases of COVID, 2.5% of Richmond, and 3.5% of Prince Edward County. And then based on those total cases, so for Virginia, for the just under 200,000 cases, about 7.9 of them resulted in hospitalizations. 8% of the total cases in Richmond resulted in hospitalizations, and 5% of the total cases in Prince Edward County um, uh, resulted in hospitalizations. And I wanted to take this a step further and look at, well, what are the um, stats for, um, for, um, for COVID based on race? And so what we see is that in Virginia, um, the Black community makes up about 20% of the pre of, of, I'm sorry, about 20% of the population in Virginia is identifies as Black, when 25% of the cases um, of COVID-19 in Virginia affected the Black community. Um, you see major discrepancies here with the Latinx uh, population is 10% of our community in Virginia, but 27% of the cases impacted the, the Latinx community. When we look at Piedmont um, region, which is the region where my university is held, we see once again some disparities, most notably with the Black community as they make up 31% of the population but experience 41% of our cases. And then if we look at the city of Richmond, we see again that the Black community made up about 47% of the community um, and experienced 42% of the cases, but most notably, once again, with the Latinx community, we see um, wide di uh, discrepancies between these two in that only 7% of the Richmond population identifies as Latinx, but they um, encountered 31% of our cases. And so we see a lot of these um, differences in, in equities in terms of who is being affected most directly um, in the state of Virginia and in these um, two regions. In addition, when we're thinking about inequities, a lot of what we saw this year 
were in the um, social movements and the demonstrations as a response to the inhumane murder of George Floyd. Um, and so I wanna bring our focus to that now as we think about the social unrest that we um, experienced. And Richmond, Virginia had many, many different demonstrations um, in response to the murder of George Floyd. And these demonstrations in Richmond happened, of course, all over the city, um, most predominantly on Monument Avenue and downtown, um, Richmond and a couple of other places around the city. Um, and so I remember speaking to one person in particular about, um, as some people will call it, the defacing of the monuments in Monument Avenue. Uh, Monument Avenue is a very popular street in the city of Richmond that runs east to west, and it, ha it housed um, five different monuments honoring um, Confederate figures, including J.E.B. Stewart, Stonewall Jackson, Jefferson Davis, uh, Matthew Fontaine Murray, and Robert E. Lee. And so in response to the demonstration, or as part of the demonstrations, there were some individuals who, as you can see, um, decorated, if you will, some of these monuments. And so this particular person I was talking to while she says she understood the messaging and why people were demonstrating and why they were upset and she agreed with the cause. She said that it was very um, difficult for her to uh, look at some of the profane um, and strong languaging that was being used because there were definitely words of profanity on many of these monuments. And my initial and innate response was, well, yes, it can be difficult to see these words written at the same time for me as a person of color, more specifically a black person, this is what I often would view, just seeing the monuments. And so now to me, this is more of a symbol of what these monuments actually stood for, um, for persons potentially in my community. Um, and so as that, you know, we see the different treatment of individuals. Um, with the demonstrations, we did see um, a lot of police brutality and that these demonstrators of, you know, mixed social identities and a very diverse crowd were all being targeted equally. Um, by the police when they were trying to break up these predominantly peaceful protests and demonstrations. And so during public testimony, specifically on June 8th for Richmond City Council, we saw a lot of conversations about how families and children were targeted by this police brutality. And much of the conversation um, among people of color said, well, this is nothing different from what we had been seeing before. It's just now that those who may not have previously been targeted or those in the dominant culture are now also experiencing what people of, of color have been experiencing for years. So once again, I go back to these inequities exposed. It's not that they were exposed, is that now maybe they are of greater awareness to people who were not um, before really as aware of what was um, happening and what was going on, um, or maybe it was easier for them to look away. And so I wanted to put up a, a couple comments from the public testimony that people now have that heightened awareness and are more actively seeking for uh, racial justice and racial equity, um, especially within our city. Um, I will say that as of now, four of the five monuments on Monument Avenue have been removed and the fifth one, the Robert E. Lee statue is now pending removal as well. And so during the um, city council meetings, we heard a lot about defunding the police. Um, there was a lot of talk about um, the salaries of police officers and the money spent on Richmond Police Department and calls for defunding them and allocating that money to other services. A lot of the arguments that we heard were about taking that money from the police department and um, giving it to education or to social services under the guise that we have been defunding educational programs, especially as it relates to music and the art. Um, and so if we can do that for those institutions, we can do it for the police department as well. And so once again, out of curiosity, I wanted to kind of fact check and do my own research to see, well, how is the money um, in Richmond's budget being allocated? And so what we can see from this diagram that I pulled from the 2021 adopted uh, um, budget for the fiscal year 2021 is that we can really break down Richmond's uh, budget into three sections. One is public safety, one is education, and then the other six categories fall, fall into that final third. So as far as public safety, that is 34% of the adopted uh, fiscal year 2021 budget uh, for the city of Richmond. Of that 34% that's going to public safety, almost half, 48% of that is going to the R Richmond Police Department. Um, the other half is split between the office, fire and emergency management, um, and 
emergency communications and animal care and control. And then because there were so much discussions about um, social services and investing in them, I wanted to see, well, where does social services fall in terms of our budget? And social services funding falls under the health and welfare portion of um, Richmond's budget, which is only 12% of Richmond's overall budget. And of that 12%, 75% of that is um, dedicated to social services, which includes things like CSA, refugee assistance, uh, child protective services, adult protective services, adoption, foster care, family preservation. And so when we really break it down, right, we know half of the public safety budget is for RPD or Richmond Police Department, and 75% of the health and welfare budget is for social services. What we see if we break that down is that social services only comprises about 7.3% of Richmond's overall budget, where the Richmond Police Department is just under twice that amount with 13% of the RVA um, budget. And so breaking that down further, I wanna see, well, how is the money being sent? And so the total operating budget uh, for the adopted fiscal year 2021 is just under $100 million for the Richmond Police Department. And social services has about 71 million. So I broke it down per capita and you can see how it's being sent, uh, spent based on personnel services, um, the operating budget, special funds, and then the Richmond Police Department um, had a little bit of the capital improvement plan which does not um, apply to the 2021 adopted year. Um, so we have a lot of calls in Richmond for really looking at how is the money being spent? What is it going to? And really reinvesting in more of those preventative measures. Um, and then finally, um, I wanted to talk about what does this mean for me and what am I doing in my personal role to address systemic um, injustice in my communities? And a lot of what I do um, is within my role as assistant professor of social work at a uh, four-year state institution. Um, so I often have active discussions in my classes regarding not just racial disparities, but disparities and inequities that we see across different social identities, um, whether it's um, based on race, age, class, um, ability, socioeconomic status, et cetera. Um, I've also had the honor and privilege to serve on a committee that developed a race and ethnic studies minor. And we will be piloting the intro course for that minor this spring. And I am able to co-teach that. And so um, creating that program that will then transcend on to other students um, as they progress during their undergraduate degree is something that I have contributed to. And then I've also been uh, very intentional about the programming that I engage in on campus. Uh, most notably in my first year on this campus, I was under a visiting assistant professor contract and I worked hard to organize and then to co-facilitate a week-long film discussion of the 2014 documentary film, I'm Not Racist, Am I? Which looks at the racial experiences of 12 teenagers in New York City as they really recognize what does it mean to be racist? What is systemic racism? And how am I contributing to that? And how can I fight against it? I also work part-time as an outpatient therapist. Um, in addition to um, focusing on mental health and trauma and depression and anxiety, a lot of my caseload is really looking at the experience, the racial experiences of my clients um, as I focus on those race relations. And so as I began working as an outpatient therapist, I saw that there, I received a lot of clients who sought me out because of my work um, in regard to racial identity and how to navigate those different racial spaces. And then this year, especially I saw an influx of those clients, especially clients of color who are coming to seek services due to anxieties regarding the pandemic and the inequities that we see there, and as well as the current social rest and how um, they're often not feeling safe and having to you know, renegotiate once more how they're navigating in um, their different um, societies and systems in which they belong. And then finally, as a doctoral student um, um, seeking a degree in transformative social change, I'm using this in, uh, with a research focus on the white racial experience in terms of what is white racial identity? What is the white racial experience? Um, and how do things like white racial affect, which looks at white guilt, white shame, white fragility, um, how does that impact the racial experience? How can we quantify um, those different affects and um, how do those different accents, how does white shame and how does white privilege and how does white fragility impact the white racial experience in terms of how people tend to identify or act either as a racist or a non-racist or an anti-racist. 
Um, and it's with my hope that by understanding how um, those affects contribute to the white racial experience, we can then uh, begin to target more interventions directed to um, people who identify within the white community so that they are, have a greater awareness um, and can no longer bypass many of these inequities that are exposed, but instead actively engage um, to engage in that uh, racial equity and racial awareness. Um, so that is my portion of the presentation. Thank you so much for uh, your attention and I look forward to answering any questions later on. Thank you, Shayla. <clears throat> that was really insightful, I appreciate it. I'm gonna actually ask people if they have any questions or comments just for a moment and then we'll move to PC and then we'll have time at the end for more extensive dialogue. So does anyone, anything that strikes you from what Shayla shared or if you have a question? I, I have a question. I just am curious about the numbers that you collected around COVID and whether that was um, comparable to the national average. Did you, did you look at that or, or is, is it unique to your geographic area? Yeah, that's a great question. I went back and forth about whether or not to collect national data and what that would be. Um, and I started to just stay with Virginia because I didn't want to get too spread out. <laughs> I wanted to have a little bit of a focus, but that is something that I definitely have noted to look at in terms of the national averages. Yeah, I just was curious if it was better or worse, but I wasn't trying to give you more work. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay, I already gave it to myself. <laughs> Good, anything else that Anything that struck you? I'll just say, um, Shayla, when I was listening to you, I really appreciated how you spoke about the maldistribution of comfort in terms of racial identity and like recognizing that that actually tangibly links to the material inequities. So, and then leaving it from saying, all right, so if we, if we understand that, um, tying that to your own work in challenging systemic racism was really helpful. So thank you. Thank you. So let's shift to PC. All right. Good afternoon. I assume it's afternoon. I'm in California, so I'm assuming everyone else is afternoon right now. Um, I'm going to share my screen also. Let's do that. Make sure that it's all available for you. Everyone can see it. Yes. And if I, yes. Okay. And hopefully if I do this, did it go to a new slide? All right, we're all good then. Uh, yes, my name is PC Walker. I am uh, in Northern California, just outside of Sacramento. And uh, for the purpose of this presentation, I represent the community um, that is a conservative Christian university. Uh, I've been working in conservative Christian higher ed for uh, quite a while, for almost 20 years. And uh, most of my professional career has been in that, in that field and in that zone. And so looking at uh, the inequalities that are exposed, particularly uh, since, since COVID began to expose some things within that, that idea of even what, um, even what Shayla had already mentioned, that there's, the, these things were already there and they were already exposed, but there is something about the fishbowl that that COVID created for us that made us look at it, uh, that made us look at what has already been exposed along the way. So uh, my goal just for the few moments that I have here is to look at particularly uh, at a big picture of higher education in general. And then as I go through the three different dilemmas that I wanted to look at um, that were exposed, then it kind of gets a little bit more focused as we go along into my specific community, or at least my specific context as uh, at a Christian university. Uh, so I want to start talking about the disparities that we've seen even just since uh, COVID hit and what what were kind of revealed in those those spaces. And then I'm going to look a little bit at blame and adherence to or lack of adherence to different directives. And then we'll look at ignorance and silence. Um, this first slide here, uh, for those who aren't, don't have video on, uh, this slide is a quote from Paul LeBlanc. Paul LeBlanc is the president of Southern New Hampshire University, and he wrote this quote in, uh, in his article uh, in Forbes magazine. He said, if one were designing a place in which to quickly spread the coronavirus, it would be hard to outdo a prison, 
a nursing home or a college campus. And that sets a pretty significant tone for uh, what uh, begins to be revealed when we start to look at universities as they began to make the conversation of whether they would reopen um, after all of, uh, after, you know, we had students that left in March uh, of last year and then, um, then after Corona hit and then uh, the, the determination of whether or not to come back uh, is where we start to see things come across. Uh, in one of those disparities, as we started to see conversations, uh, and this is uh, through some of the work that is, is tagged at the bottom here from Salingo and his, um, in, in, the, in his study, but he was showing that, uh, that there was a disparity. There's always kind of been a fissure in, in, in higher education between faculty and staff. There's always been kind of like this divide that some universities do well to bridge that divide and some just 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 say there's a divide and we're just gonna leave it at that. Uh, but there's been this difference in when we start to look at uh, whether or not we're going to reopen, how we're going to reopen. Uh, there was this, there was began to be a, a revealing disparity between faculty and staff in that, um, first of all, just in the terms alone, like when we say faculty, we, we know what that means. We know that that means those who teach in the classroom uh, and that is what that includes. But when you talk about staff, that is pretty amorphous because it involves everybody else. Uh, that does involve, uh, involve co-curricular staff and student affairs staff like, like I uh, operate in and we would see ourselves as educators outside of the classroom. Uh, we're doing on the ground work with the students, but we are still staff and in that uh, we still have to be present. We still have to be here. And yes, uh, staff entails co-curricular, but it also includes everyone else. Um, that considers, uh, you got to talk about kitchen staff, right, who still have to come on campus and prepare food uh, for the students if we choose to reopen. That includes uh, housekeeping staff who come in overnight to help to put themselves at risk and continue to make those spaces clean and sanitary for the students so that they can actually be there present. Um, and most of those aren't covered under healthcare. They're not covered under or get paid adequately enough to to come in and put themselves at risk to make some make places sanitary for students to continue to, to go to school. Uh, so part of the disparity is just re revealed in the fact that when we say faculty, we mean those who teach in the classroom or teach outside of the classroom for this case, but those who are teaching and then staff includes everybody else. So uh, flexibility was provided and accommodations were provided for staff or in faculty, but in general, part of the study that Salingo put out uh, showed that 900 colleges, out of 900 colleges and universities that allowed employees to work from home in the beginning of the stages, 300 only extended that benefit to faculty. So that's a third of, at least the universities that they studied, only a third of them even provided that opportunity uh, to, to staff and faculty, or only provided that opportunity to faculty to work from home, and they made all the accommodations possible and made it made sure that it was okay for and safe for faculty to continue to teach, and uh, and that doesn't include uh, staff like like for instance me. I'm a, my position is a residential position, and uh, so my family and I live on campus with the students. And the considerations of what does it look like for me to do what I do safely were kind of an afterthought. Uh, it, at least as it appeared, it looked like it was quite a bit of an afterthought. Um, also, part of that study showed that half of the colleges and universities in the United States that, that did layoffs or furloughs um, only did so for staff. So they only were laying off staff. They were only letting go of staff uh, when they enacted those things. That's half of those people only did that for, for staff. So there's something that begins to, to be in that thing because from the moment conversations around safely reopening began, at least here at this university, I can speak from that context, students and faculty were prioritized first and then staff appeared to be an afterthought. How do we make sure that we provide safely 
to reopen for uh, the rest of our staff. So faculty were able to voice their concerns, voice their safety concerns regarding returning to school, but most of the staff positions had no choice but to return. Uh, and this, they had to go and they had to be here quickly uh, without much time to adapt uh, or have adequate training of what it looks like to do that safely. Uh, the other disparity, which uh, is which is there's plenty of research around and, and plenty of literature to dive into, but just the idea of the data poor and data poverty uh, going online when we when we choose to to put everything online, it makes a it makes a couple of assumptions. Uh, it assumes first of all that students have access to the resources that are needed for laptops and computers and Wi-Fi, and specifically. It assumes that students have the space to do that. I, I know friends who uh, are teaching classes and some of their the students that come from large households only have are meeting like in the bathroom because it's the only place they can have like like quiet uh, and, and enough to even focus on what they're doing. And so even the space is is an assumption that people have if they stay home and they don't reopen, but we go completely online. There are certain assumptions that are made. Uh, there's also an assumption made for faculty. Um, faculty members, uh, we make the assumption that they are fully qualified and capable of navigating all online coursework. There are some of our long-standing uh, faculty members at this university who were essentially forced into an earlier than hoped for retirement because they have said, I could never and will never teach online. And, um, and so, they weren't prepared to, to be done this early, but because of these circumstances and because there weren't enough co accommodations for the assumption that they, they should just know how to do this or they should just be able to, to do this naturally uh, is a pretty significant assumption that uh, informs how we choose whether or not to reopen or not. Uh, another thing is that there is, there is in this fishbowl of COVID, like there are a lot of things that are there out there for us in this digitized world that we live in. But part of that is that we have misinformation everywhere. So part of understanding data poverty is that there is, there's not access to information that has been reviewed and been uh, integral in actual formation. And so with that, um, we have only, we're left to whatever information we can find. And, access to data and reviewed data and true data and information in a digitized world means that there are digital inequalities when I don't have access to, um, to good information and, and information that is, is actually vital for what I'm trying to do. Um, so in that, access to data is an issue of visibility. It's an issue of survival, particularly for students. Um, and students who don't have access to the resources that we're talking about are at a loss. So uh, we're also seeing that students who did come back but still have no resource to access there, there's a stigma that comes with not having access to the things that most people take for granted. So we're seeing that students may not have the access or resource, they're unwilling to speak up and ask for those resources. Uh, there's kind of this spiral of silence that begins to affect uh, because of that stigma and that silence to speak up is translating to poorer uh, grades and a lacking student academic success. Uh, and we're seeing that play out over and over again. I just had a meeting this morning where we were talking about a kind of a fatigue for our students who um, are having no connection with other people. And, and it's all online and it's all Zoom and, and there's a fatigue that comes with that. Uh, for a lack of connection and that I mean that that's a lack of personal connection that we're all feeling uh, but when we assume that everyone has access to those things then it also informs beyond that uh, this next thing here is talking about blame and adherence um, a study done at the University of Utah which I have also uh, cited at the bottom predicted two different responses uh, from religious responses and levels of adherence to the rules, the regulations, the directives, uh, directives like shelter in place, directives like uh, wearing a mask at all times. Um, and in this study, what was, was really fascinating was that they, they projected and predicted two different responses from religious contexts. Uh, and their first, their first prediction was a positive response. Um, they 
they predicted on one hand, religiosity in any context would actually reflect a willingness to follow the directives that uh, were given from, uh, from government directives or regulations. Um, their positive would be the willingness to follow because they, they have an altruistic nature to those directives because in, in effect, those, those directives are supposed to be caring for people and stopping the spread. So the first prediction is that there would be a positive willingness from religious institutions to follow the directives and follow the rules because they are caring for people in the end and they're altruistic in nature. Uh, that also assumes on a different level that all religious uh, background is altruistic, which is a different conversation than right now. But, um, but the other prediction that they made was the negative uh, impact that the prediction might be that as we study religious institutions response to the directives that there, we might actually see an uproar of several religious communities uh, in a possibility because they see the directives as a challenge to their freedom and particularly their religious freedom. Uh, and what I am finding in the context that, that I work in and, and live in is that the latter <laughs> negative prediction is playing out over and over again. Uh, we have local pastors even in our community who have been very vocal in the direction of the latter prediction of this study. I mean, these are significantly large churches with very large congregations. And one of the pastors that were mentioned in the Sacramento Bee, the local newspaper here, uh, having told his congregations that they were, that they're, engaged in a spiritual battle because, between good and evil. He said the church has been called to fight the government for the right to worship freely, free of persecution and without restriction, even in the clutches of a global pandemic. Now, that could appear to be uh, just like, you know, that one outlier over there who's speaking up uh, too, mu too much and too loudly on the outside, but what we're finding, what I'm finding is that when considering a conservative Christian university and college uh, and other administrative decisions to reopen, to remain open, or what to even regulate if we do reopen, uh, really continues to go after that last bit of, uh, of predicting um, that we are finding that, that all of those decisions are being navigated by assuming that we are being attacked for our religious freedom. Our religious freedoms are being attacked by these directives that are coming through. And so that informs a certain type of thing uh, for what we, we go to because it leads to a second part of this idea of blame and shame when we ostracize students when, stu when outbreaks happen. So when the university administration determines whether or not they'll be a, they will abide by government directives to reopen, there's not much consideration for the reality that we're actually talking about a population made up primarily of 18 to 22 year olds who will also have to abide by the regulations and the directives once they arrive on campus. And in most occasions, most occasions the, that decision-making process initially is driven by revenue and this perception of religious freedom being taken away. But not much is taken, there's not, not much is spoken of regarding the administration, what they would do in the case of an outbreak, because yes, there's protocol. We, you know, we brought people back, we reopened, completely reopened, and we have certain protocols, safety protocols. But what I mean to reference is there's this lack of responsibility to be taken in the event of an outbreak. Uh, when the outbreak happens on a campus like ours, administration immediately casts shame on the student population for not maintaining all the regulations. And it's at that moment that the conversation has shifted of responsibility. It's no longer about our religious freedom anymore. When we made that decision in, in the past to reopen and disregard the directives from the government and open anyway, and it was in our religious freedom, but now that there's an outbreak, we're blaming all of the student body, all of the student body for having this outbreak. So administration takes the initial responsibility when making executive decisions to reopen against the directives of the local government. But once 18 year olds and 22 year olds contract or spread the virus, then we start to shame the student body for the university needing to quarantine now and to isolate and to potentially close. And shame is just not an effective public health strategy. But uh, that's the case. 
I, I am running out of time. So I will, I will put this up here really quick. And then if I need to answer more questions in, in the end, uh, we have basically after the return of this summer uh, and the murder of George Floyd and the growing tension, tension that was already there has always been there. Uh, we had a lot of our students uh, return to a campus that uh, where they already historically felt like they were disregarded. And um, Christian higher education is historically and presently predominantly a very white uh, context. And our black indigenous and other students of color, students, staff and faculty of color are historically marginalized here. And this summer was nothing new that was revealed, like Shayla already mentioned, but as we've already indicated, privileged students and uh, in-group students um, had to stop and actually pay attention. And coming out of this summer into this school year, it was critical that universities like ours and every university particularly be prepared to actually address the trauma that was felt and expressed by our students. And, um, in many of the conversations that I've had this semester with our black students, I have been told on many occasions that they returned to a campus where they never felt like they fully belonged anyway, uh, but they returned after this summer and the divide felt stronger for two reasons. Uh, they felt like there was a common, there's two common themes that have come through a lot of these conversations I've had this semester. Uh, in one, they felt like they had a spotlight on them at all times, uh, which is nothing new. We already know that if you're part of an out group instead of an in group or a dominantly or a group that's not dominantly represented, you already stick out and as though there's already a spotlight that's always being cast upon you. But it was much worse when our students returned to campus after a summer of George Floyd's murder and the growing tensions in our country with that. Uh, and secondly, the, the campus was, was in general pretty silent about the issues that needed to be addressed. Uh, we shifted our focus uh, and a lot of our narrative to COVID and um, how to pay attention to COVID, how to be safe, and uh, in a lot of conversation about our freedoms, uh, but not much was spoken about the, the racial strife and the trauma that uh, many of our students, faculty, and staff have felt, and the ability to determine which issues are worth talking about and which ones are not is a privilege and our campus community has continued to have conversations about COVID and has fallen pretty silent regarding the racial strife that needed to be addressed. Um, and in that we, you know, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing a, just a, a disregard for that conversation. And, uh, and I'm off, I'll close with this. Uh, I'm, I'm often asked why I stay here. <laughs> and uh, part of the answer to that question is while I, have resisted the conservatism part of my faith background. I'm not discarded or given up on the actual Christian parts of my faith and background. But the primary answer to that is uh, there's work to be done. And, uh, and I, can be more, I can be a more significant agent of transformation here uh, because I'm actually able to address the, the systemic injustices uh, from the inside. And so I am shifting narrative in the courses I get to teach. I shift the narrative in the programs that I, be, I get to facilitate and in mentorships that I get to navigate. So all of that stuff is still possible. Uh, and it would certainly not happen if somebody like me didn't stay here and stay stick it out and try to do what I can to influence that change. So uh, that's it. There's so much more, but I, I talked for a long time. So uh, I'll, I'm happy to answer more questions in the future. Thank you, PC. You raised so many interesting questions and ideas that we'll have a chance to talk a little bit more about later. Um, I just want to give people a chance. Does anyone have a specific question or something that struck you about PC's thoughts? And then we'll have the ending after we have Nancy's, we'll have a large group dialogue on anything. Casey, I just want to um, acknowledge you for staying there. And I think um, growing up Christian and not necessarily having that exact faith now, but reading a lot about Jesus and how he was a, an agent for nonviolent change, just as an individual, I, I really see you living in that spirit. So 
um, to thank you for, for being there because that's, that's where you are needed. Thanks, Susanna. It's so good to see you. Thank you, Susanna. And I was really struck by your last, um, your last comment is like, why am I staying there? And it just seemed so evident to me that the spotlight that you're talking about is like, you are one of those people who is shining that spotlight on conversations that need to happen and actions that need to happen so that the inequities are not put on uh, some people's shoulders and, and not others. And so, and, the, and also the, the need for an institutional response um, just really was a, a very interesting point. So I'm gonna pass it to Nancy. Actually, Wim has a comment here and I'll just read it for those of you who are not able to see it. Um, so Wim says, um, I had a very hard time being feeling Christian in the armpit of California when I was younger. So I could really relate. He could really relate to what PC was saying. Thank you, Wim. Nancy. Well, hello. Um, it doesn't look like I can advance my slides. Are you seeing anything change when I hit? Hmm. It's still on the first slide. I know when Shayla double clicked on her slide, it moved. So interesting. I'm going to try that again. OK, great. Um, so first of all, it's great to see so many friendly faces. Thank you so much um, for the opportunity to share uh, in this presentation today. I'm, I'm really going to keep with a lot of the themes that Shayla and PC, my colleagues, already discussed in terms of inequities that have always been there, but now we're, we're kind of seeing them a little bit more. I just want to set the space a little bit. I'm going to be talking about a specific community in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, where I live. Um, I'm really looking at things uh, in terms of a social system and how this system all works, or in this case, started to break down uh, when the pandemic hit. So for today's theme about addressing um, inequities exposed and addressing systemic injustice, uh, for me, um, I'm focusing on how a pandemic shed the light on invisible inequities that simply reinforce the social order here in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. But I think most of what I'm going to talk about today and the observations that I've made over the last 10 months, you'll probably recognize them in your own communities as well. So uh, when we're talking about the theme of polarization, in our community, the pandemic has revealed a huge gap, a gully, a gulf, however you want to put it, in wealth and accessibility. Wealth is pretty self-explanatory, but when I'm talking about accessibility, I mean access to decision makers, access to services, access to amenities, and even physical ac access to some of the places in your town or your community. And that revealed um, some sort of polarization within our community as we began to see this gap that already existed get wider and wider. And so Portsmouth, New Hampshire, we are a tiny little state in New England. Uh, we're on the seacoast. We're right in between the giant state of Maine and the very populated state of Massachusetts. There's about 19 miles of shoreline in Portsmouth. It's a community of 21,000 people. We're about to celebrate our 400th anniversary. We're a historic community. We're a charming community. Um, we're very tourist heavy. So we have a, we, we did have a very big and very robust tourism and service industry community. Um, so as you can see from this slide, Portsmouth also, because of its proximity to Boston, New York, and just the Northeast in general, we do skew on the wealthy side. Uh, we're in a state that is uh, a predominantly uh, homogenous state, white, wealthy, educated as compared to the national levels. 
um, and across the board from per capita income to earnings, whether you're a man or a woman, um, we, we do uh, see our averages above the national average. And as you can see, um, we're, we're almost half uh, compared to the national level at individuals living below the poverty level. So that's the, that's the makeup of our coastal community. And um, gotta love a, a, a budget grab. I pulled this slide from this year's uh, fiscal 21 budget. And um, I was a city councilor in Portsmouth for two terms for four years. So I can only look at my community through the lens of a social system. I also have a master's in public administration. So uh, this kind of stuff is, is how I view uh, my community and how I view things. And I'm very familiar with this budget and this graphic. And while I can tell you that um, our $120 million budget, that number does jump up every year as salaries increase, cost of living, and just cost of doing business. These ratios that you see are pretty consistent. So we always have had the largest bulk of our budget go toward the school department. Uh, we, the rest of general government has always been the next big chunk. And that, that goes for everything from public works to um, welfare department to finance department to, you know, um, building and planning. So a lot, a lot, a lot of city government happens in that sort of tan square. And then as you can see, our police and fire department uh, are the next biggest uh, parts of the budget. If you put them together, they make up 23% of the budget. It's, it's a not insignificant number, but um, it definitely does not eclipse uh, what we're spending on education. And um, it's not too much bigger than what we're spending on general government. Um, and as I go through uh, some of the observations in the last 10 months, um, I think you'll see that uh, some of these ratios are probably overdue for a, a really big um, reconsideration and having been on the side of policy making decision to pass budgets like this, I do wish that um, I do wish that we had had some sort of opportunity to really reflect on our community while we were going through a almost six month long budget process every year because um, we did kind of do business as usual for a while there. Uh, the pandemic, of course, has changed all of that. So while I've painted the picture of Portsmouth as a higher than average um, wealth per capita community, we are a regional hub here in northern New England. And so people come from surrounding towns of about six to eight different communities. We have the largest stock of public housing, federally funded public housing in the region. We have the most shelters. We have um, the largest recovery center and other um, you know, reha rehabilitation hospitals. And we have um, the largest uh, cancer center in the region. So there's a, there's a lot of services that our community provides that both out that come from our city's budget, but just, you know, it, it, regionally we provide a lot of services. So although demographically on paper, we look one way, the reality of our community is much more diverse. Um, and I think that there is a lot more uh, falling below the radar than people realize, which seems to be the theme of today. So in my observations of what happened in the middle of March when our government did the mandatory shutdown and only open for essential services, I observed uh, five areas where we really started to understand where these existing inequities really began to expose themselves in ways, as Shayla said, that was really hard to continue to ignore. And I will go through all of these after I sort of list through them. So, so one is housing, another is the school services that we provide, public transportation, civic engagement, which is of course one of my huge, huge areas of interest, and our public spaces in general. So when we talk about housing, 
As I mentioned, we are uh, a 400 year old community, uh, very historic, very charming. What that means is our area, our land area is already pretty much built up. So there's not a lot of new construction because of the historic nature, we have very restrictive zoning and housing and building um, policies. This has led to a huge supply and demand where there is much, much, much more demand than there is supply. This of course inflates the cost of any existing housing stock. So people have already been priced out of living in Portsmouth and even in some of the surrounding towns. What happened during the pandemic, what we've seen anecdotally, and now we're starting to see in um, quarterly real estate reporting, is that people from New York, New Jersey, the Boston metropolitan area, and other bigger areas in the Northeast that have been hard hit by COVID, people have fled those communities and they're searching for smaller cities that have all of the same amenities like Burlington, Vermont, like Portland, Maine, like Portsmouth, New Hampshire, because um, it feels safer in terms of COVID and they still have that cosmopolitan feel, but with a, with a much, um, much less exposure. So what that done is just exacerbated a housing crunch. And interestingly, it's gone into the rental market. So before the shutdown, our downtown was filled with cafes and restaurants and hotels and thousands of service workers who lived in the rental units in our community. The rents were very high, but people made it work, you know, five people in one apartment, that sort of thing. Uh, what's happening now is those families who are moving from other metropolitan areas are moving into the rental units while they wait for stock to open up. And instead of our unemployed service workers uh, staying in those rental apartments, they're getting completely priced out and pushed out of the community. So that is a new development that has further exacerbated not just the housing market, but the rental market as well. Prices are going up, not down. When we talk about school services, and I know this is something that happened in communities across the country. Suddenly, schools were left to figure out how to provide all of those services beyond education that was happening in the schools and bring it out to the communities. So while Portsmouth is, again, um, highly educated, affluent community, 30% of our school age children are on some sort of free or reduced lunch. And suddenly the first two weeks of the shutdown were spent on figuring out how to deliver breakfast and lunch to thousands of children across the city. That was priority number one. Priority number two was, well, when we're gonna be talking about um, remote learning, how do we make sure every child who needs it has access to internet and the equipment that they need iPads, laptops. So that was number two, how to get physical equipment into every home. But then we started to see that you could do that. You could deliver food and you could set students up for distance learning, but not every student had family, guardians, adults in the household who could help them either with time management, either with um, just being a self directed learner. I mean, we just saw the whole breakdown of, of students um, who just didn't have really good guidance in the home. And that went across culture, economic, and educational um, uh, the spectrum. I mean, I have highly, highly educated friends in summer, even ac like academics themselves, like university professors who could not for the life of them adequately um, homeschool their children during the pandemic. Like people were waving the white flag left and right. So in some cases, students didn't have ad adults in the home because their families were perhaps um, essential workers. In some cases, students had families who 
English was not their first language. And in some cases, students had families who just simply couldn't manage the, um, the challenge of homeschooling. So, so there was that. And then the, the school's responsibility is, is how do we still reach every student? Um, and then on top of that, we had all of the faculty um, across the counseling services trying to figure out what to do about the students at risk, whether they were in farm, harm's way um, from, from abusive households, whether they were at risk because they had additional learning needs and individual, ed, individual education plans, like all kinds of risk in the home. And suddenly those professionals who are dedicated to those students were trying to figure out how to deliver those services. So although we are dedicating half of our city's annual budget to, to the education department, these challenges just continue to open up the gaps when we try to obviously do this within individual homes. And that's not something that was unique, especially to Portsmouth, but if we were experiencing this many challenges with the demographics that we have in this community, um, one can only imagine what it's like in communities that don't have such robust funding for education. Um, another thing that happened uh, almost overnight was our, our public transportation system, which is already a challenge. The state of New Hampshire has no income tax and no sales tax. And the only way to raise money at the local and state level is through property taxes. So needless to say, so many social and community services um, are just not funded and they have to find alternative ways to, to pay for things either through fee for service, grants or, or corporate funding. Um, so our public transportation system is a challenge, it's, it's a big geographical area and it's not well funded. And then overnight ridership just dried up. The only people riding public transportation were essential workers. So the result was a, a complete pulling back of schedules, of routes and of service. So those people who needed to get to work in the emergency couldn't get to work. So there was a complete breakdown. And what ended up happening was the city had to step in with some of their emergency contingency funds and, and, and provide a stopgap until CARES Act funding could come in to the local county to then supplement public transportation. Um, the next area was civic engagement. And we saw some power shifts change here, which actually it exposed inequities before the pandemic that sort of began to neutralize themselves during the pandemic. And that's because before the pandemic, all public meetings were held in person at city hall. And this is something that is endemic in public participation across the country, a certain type of person would participate. This person was usually, not always, but usually retired, had time on their hands, more often than not grievance driven, um, very vocal and demographically skewed older, wealthier and whiter than the rest of the community. These are, these are studies that have been done on, on who shows up for public meetings. Well, since the shutdown, all public meetings, like everywhere else, went to Zoom. And that technology created a barrier for some of the habitual participants in public discourse who really dominated the conversation and pretty much had the ear of the media, of the decision makers, and really drove a lot of the conversation and some of the policy decisions, suddenly they became neutralized. And when I was watching public meetings on Zoom where anybody could register, anybody could participate from their home as long as they had a smartphone or a computer, which that's a whole nother area of inaccessibility, but what happened is some of those habitual speakers and um, the small minority that sort of dominated all of our public conversations, uh, they were not the main players. All of a sudden you started hearing over the Zoom call during public comment, 
families with young children because they wanted to talk about what was going on in their home during the shutdown with school. Suddenly you started to hear from people from the service industry who were wondering about how they were gonna continue to live and work in this community. You started to hear from small business owners, from young professionals. And so I was sitting there thinking, okay, so this is a shift that's that's really changed the face of civic engagement. And if anybody in city leadership was looking to build on that sort of shift, it, it would be a really good opportunity to do that. And then the last thing uh, we noticed was our some blind spots in our public spaces, meaning um, city plazas, public parks, and other public gathering areas, because as we all know, especially in the beginning of the shutdown, people went outside, people tried to gather in places and still remain safe. And what we discovered was all kinds of inequities and all kinds of imbalance in terms of just basic safety. Our, our, our public spaces, we realized they weren't well lit. We realized that if a public space was not close to commercial activity, people didn't want to go there. They didn't feel safe. Um, depending on the kind of upkeep, uh, there were challenges. So for part of the pandemic, there was still snow. Well, if there wasn't adequate snow removal, we had whole areas of public gathering space that were inaccessible to people. Um, we also saw that um, in terms of physical accessibility, things like we're in a historic community where you have cobblestones and bricks and granite curbs, people with wheelchairs, people with strollers, they physically couldn't go to these areas even if they wanted to. Um, so, 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 so we started to see that although we have these areas, when an increase in use came and people were using them for all kinds of things from birthday parties to school, to school meetings and, and even some civic meetings were held in some of these parks that they really weren't um, living up to their potential. Um, and we also saw that um, there were opportunities that weren't realized where public spaces could become multifunctional and could very easily become year round public spaces, but that weren't. And as somebody living in Northern New England where it's it's cold out seven months of the season here, it's more cold than not. Um, what a wasted opportunity to have these publicly funded public spaces really sit empty for most of the year. So, so those are some of the blind spots um, that this pandemic helped us realize and um, the way in which the community interacted with those spaces really revealed that um, we weren't we weren't thinking about everybody in our community. We weren't thinking about the safety of women. We weren't thinking about the accessibility of people with physical um, disabilities. And we weren't thinking about the many different ways we could use public spaces. So as I'm sitting here watching all of this take place and hunkering down for another winter and potentially another shutdown as cases begin to soar, I was left wondering like, so, so what now? Do we just continue to spot problem solve like in the immediate interest of, of fixing something right here and now and then just go back to normal? Do we do, we do that? Um, are we sort of having this reactive uh, feeling of, well, um, we're just going to adopt to this dominant ideology because it's the normal, natural way. It's the way we've always done things. Um, and I'm taking a quote from one of the texts from Joy's course in transformative learning theory. Um, or, you know, do we take this opportunity as an emancipatory learning opportunity and say, well, we don't, we don't really have to go back to normal. We don't have to assume that just because we've done it this way forever, in our case, you know, 400 years in our community in some ways, that, um, that we have to continue to do this. And from a systems theory point of view, I think this is a really incredible opportunity to sort of say, okay, so wait a minute, these are all the things we've realized and, you know, I'm doing my part to talk to city leadership. I still know people at city hall. I've been talking to the city manager and some of the city councilors because 
if we're having the right conversations, I think that we can come in and, and make some substantial change and some transformations. If the right stakeholders come to the table and we talk about things appropriately and we talk about things in a timely manner um, and we elect the right kind of people, I don't think we need to go back to the way we always have. And I've been hearing a lot of people talk about, do we really wanna go back to normal? What was normal for everybody was not necessarily equal for everybody. So I'm looking at this as an opportunity. I'm doing what I can in my own community. I don't think Portsmouth is alone. Um, and part of my uh, academic journey at Saybrook is studying the, the social system of local government. And, and hopefully many communities will start having this conversation using the pandemic as sort of the starting point um, because um, why, why would we ignore these inequities now that they have been exposed? So I'm ready for any questions if you have them. Thank you, Nancy. So we did for the other two panelists, why don't we um, just, uh, if somebody has either a question for Nancy or something that particularly strikes you, you could either ask it or you could put it in the um, chat. And then we'll move it into dialogue for all three presentations. I'll say something that struck me, Nancy, is um, I hadn't really thought about, um, I've certainly thought about access to decision-making as access to power in terms of civic engagement, but I thought it was really interesting that you pointed out that a whole different group, the people who had dominated decision-making and grievance-driven what is going to be addressed, that there was a power shift there. And so I like, you know, thinking about um, what is possible at this moment? Now, not going back to normal, it seems like that's something that um, that's a really interesting power shift you, you pointed out. PC says, uh, what was normal for everyone was not necessarily equal for everyone. He really appreciated that. Yeah, in like, all of the presentations, I sort of think that that's a theme of recognizing that COVID and the uprisings that have happened in the wake of COVID have um, made going back to normal, not something we want to do, you know, but really thinking about what a new normal will look like. And I love that all three presentations had either overtly or inadvertently focused on that, um, on, on, on a recognition of those iniquities, so. Thank you, Amanda. So let's open it up for um, questions or comments from Shayla or PC or Nancy or like Amanda, you might do a synthesizing observation. Um, so I'm going to open it up to any questions or comments people have. And again, if you want to put it in the chat that you're welcome to do it there as well. I'll just say one thing that I appreciated is that just recognizing that, yeah, the theme of the inequities coming up to the surface so that we have this possibility of naming them and then responding differently to get to that alternative future that we're thinking about, the non-normal, <laughs> um, you know, more transformative, more just. And it also seemed so helpful that once those inequities were exposed that you all added research, you all added an interpretation and analysis that can help us be informed in terms of the steps forward we might consider. So that was really helpful. It was interesting that you said that because that was, I think uh, that was actually the hard part uh, for me to find research because everything, at least as far as COVID is related is still relatively new. There's, I mean, as far as looking at in one of my on our searches specific to our communities and in the response to the inequalities that were that were revealed a little more in that um, there's just like liter the literature and the, the study and the research is just now beginning because it just began 10 months ago so it was intriguing to try to find like what what is going to inform how I address this question right now when uh, the 
in historic references, it's it's pretty new. So um, yeah, so finding that research was was intriguing <laughs> to to try to find. Well, I was impressed, EC, that you had such relevant and recent research to cite because um, you know I know that my academic production has taken a real nosedive during COVID, and I'm delighted that that's not true for everyone, and that people are are you know writing about and researching this current moment and the incredible transitions that we're facing as a as a nation and as a society overall. And yeah, and PC, me, even your looking. your felt experience at your university, like I found it really interesting that you were saying the discussion, the spotlights that you were speaking of is on religious freedom. Yeah. And and just even noticing that because you're there and you're noticing these are the discussions that we're having and these are the discussions that we're not having and how do we elevate the discussions that are more likely to um, to address everyone's needs and not just the grievances that are most vividly echoed in more national discourse. So, yeah. Shayla, were you? Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say in looking at the data, um, my approach is that we know that this is here, and so my challenge is like, as we've mentioned so many times that these inequities expose is, are they exposed to me as the individual because they're likely not being exposed to the society. And so as we navigate this, there's always data there and whether it's published or not, we have to really go onto that experiential um, side and really talk to people, well, what is your experience? Just because we don't know doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And so we want to also be creative in finding the data, right? And putting that emphasis on the qualitative just as much as the the quantitative, whether it's in a formal publication or the lived experience, which oftentimes may be um, just as quality or if not more valuable than what is in that published sense. So I just want to put that little plug in. Totally. Thank you, Shayla. And I, I'm just going to follow up on that in terms of your reflection from putting this presentation together and thinking through, is there anything that surprised you or anything that you learned that wasn't available to you before you did that research or reflection? Yes, to be noted, um, I think when looking at the date of COVID in my state, um, there were some surprises there, which is why I kind of leaned into, do I want to add that national or, but I really wanted to keep the focus on my specific communities and things like that. And really talking about that um, lived experience. And like I said, I'm a trained clinician. And so um, I'm really looking at that individual and that micro focus of what does it look like on the ground in the lived experience in the daily lives of individuals and how do we navigate that? Like what are people's responses to um, Monument Avenue and the new normal that Monument Avenue looks like and how are people internalizing that? How are people responding to um, the way that the um, protests and demonstrations were handled and what does that mean moving forward? What does that mean in somebody's daily life as they are experiencing even heightened fear about navigating and uh, their societies in terms of, am I safe? Um, what happens if I do get COVID or what happens if I do get stopped by the police? Or even just, you know, I've had one client who was very specifically saying, I don't know if I can stay at my church home because it's a great, um, very diverse population, but is very indicative of how much work our um, pastoral leadership needs. And I no longer feel like I can identify because I don't feel like I'm heard or valued and there's so much growth. I need my need, my needs that need to be met in this time while I'm navigating all this, my spiritual leader is not currently able to provide that. So does that mean now I have to rediscover myself in a new system um, that is more able to meet my needs where I am now compared to one that is still learning how to meet me where I am and to provide me the spiritual guidance. And so um, that's something I didn't get to touch in touch on as much in here, but that is something that is, is really, I'm navigating as a clinician and as a professor, and then as also um, a black person in today's society. Thank you. Any other comments or observations? Any questions? I might ask the same thing um, to you, Nancy, and then PC is doing this reflection, what became available to you that wasn't anything that was surprising or anything that you learned from putting this research together? Well, for me, it was funny. We, we had a little pre-meeting meeting, Shayla and PC and I, and I said, yeah, I have this observation 
I don't know what to do about it. What am I going to do about it? Like, what am I supposed to do about it? <laughs> you know? And, um, and so they sort of helped me navigate like the next steps. Um, PC literally said, you know, let's relate it back to the, to the text and what we're learning, you know, in some way. So I pulled in some of our transformative learning um, ideas from, from your class, but also well, yeah, what is this all for if I don't sort of start waving the flag and using what influence I do still have in my community to say, hey, you know, do you really want to go back to normal? Because you don't have to. And um, so so that was the part that um, that became I think the most exciting part to me because I didn't think about it until Shayla and PC were kind of like, well, what do you mean? What are you going to do next? Like you, you're of course going to do something. We all are. We, that's why we're here. <laughs> that's great. That's great. I was thinking when Shayla was talking about, um, you know, there's always something to count. There's always data that exists, right? There's always information that you can access. And then the trick is Nancy, so eloquently described is, you know, okay, you know, so what, what does it mean? And then now what, what do you do? And I think that um, you demonstrated exactly what's true. And for me and for most scholars that I know is that we do much better in bringing it back into conversation to try and get those answers and figure out what next directions are. And so you guys have modeled um, that collaboration process in a way that gives um, insight into how you do advocate for change. You, you know, it's change isn't something that typically happens because of one person's brilliance. It happens because of collaborative discussion and, and that sense-making process. Okay, this is the data I've collected. This is the, you know, the information that I have and how do we go about making sense of it? And I love uh, that you brought those three geographic and, um, at least geographic, diver geographically diverse areas, but obviously there were other forms of diversity um, sort of posing similar questions in different contexts and then coming back together and thinking about how to, how to collaborate on that sense-making piece. So that was excellent. Thanks, Amanda. So PC, same question, your thoughts and reflecting on what either surprised you or some takeaways from your research and reflection. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think each of us responded a little bit to like what our ongoing research is, and then how this fits perfectly into it. Uh, I I didn't get to unpack it as much because I saved it till the last, and then I was rushing to get to honor everyone's time. So, uh, but in in preparing for this, in the um, over under the umbrella of my overall research, which is like trying to figure out why there is a resistance in Christian higher education to issues of social justice and intersectionality and, and even like race theory. Um, like, why is there that resistance? A lot of the preparations for this and highlighting even like the COVID response from conservative Christian institutions uh, sh reveals some of that that still informs the other conversation. So that was intriguing to me that I went into this, like, because when we first signed up to do this, it was fresh out of COVID being announced and all the things were beginning to happen. And so the context at the beginning was uh, what has been revealed in the pandemic. And so that was just like my mindset. And I think the three of us, uh, that was our mindset to begin with. And so that was what we were looking for. And so when I looked for it that, and then they changed it to polarization. And I was like, I wish I had known that 10 months ago when I started looking at stuff. But, uh, but I realized like, even like researching for this and looking at stuff for this still informs the other research that I'm doing that even though the context doesn't make sense, like initially, it's still very much informed, like, why we have a resistance? Why is there a reactance that, and a lack of adherence to things um, in this context and in this culture? So it's still informing uh, another conversation by looking at this conversation. So uh, that was that was revealing to me and stuck out to me pretty heavily. 
Thank you. So uh, to think about closing this um, circle of discussion, why don't I, you can either choose to put an insight into the chat or you might speak it as a sentence of something that you're taking, something that struck you from the conversation. Um, so I'll give people a moment to think about it and then just let me know what, or let us all know, you know, what's one thing that you're gonna be taking or that you appreciated from this, this really interesting and creative presentations. I can, I can start us off. I, I just was thinking sort of the metaphor of bloom where you're planted kind of thing, where social change seems like a really daunting task, especially when the stakes are so high. And I love that each of you really took the place that you are, you know, geographically and the focus area that you're already engaged in, in terms of your professional work and your research interests as doctoral students. And you were able to you know, for this assignment, use it as an opportunity to clarify what what should change, what can change, what avenues there might be to, um, to advocate for change. And that was really a great inspiration to me. Thank you, Amanda. Folks are welcome to put in the chat too, if you want to just, I think, I'll, I'll also say something. Um, I think one of the things I've got a lot of ideas and I'm looking forward to having conversations in the future with all three of you on some of these overlapping ideas that I saw. But I wanna highlight um, the significance of working in collaboration. You know, I mean, because what brought us together in some ways was this idea of COVID, right? And the fact that you all um, chose, you know, similar to what Amanda was just saying, you, you chose your own specific context and dove in there to find insight. And yet it also seems that it was richer in terms of being able to collaborate with the three of you of thinking of these ideas out together. And that's, so that's inspiring for me, just to remember that we're stronger together, that we both can have the structure of our own individual insights, but that, you know, as Nancy was saying, it's like, what's next? And when we think of next, what's next, we are gonna be working in our own context, but I really love how you're reminding us that we should be always reaching out to other, to our colleagues, to our allies in social justice, to keep that inspiration going and informing our work. Um, Susanna said, well, COVID has been difficult for many. It has really created a platform for everyone to start taking a deeper look at the inequities that have been overlooked by the majority, but absolutely need to be addressed. So thank you to Shayla, PC, and Nancy for such a creative and interesting presentation that covered so many different perspectives. And I think that's a beautiful way of closing our discussion. Oh, one more from Abigail. It is easy to see COVID as something that is only negative. It's refreshing to see something positive and different coming from the pandemic. So thanks to everyone. Couldn't agree more. Congratulations, Shayla and Nancy and PC for putting together such an interesting presentation and uh, inspiring us to keep uh, working towards change and taking those opportunities that COVID has revealed both the structural inequities, but also the opportunities that can give us hope for change for a different world that is possible. <laughs> so thanks you all. And um, you can stop the recording. <laughs>